Chapter 5 Diagon Alley Harry woke early the next morning. Although he could tell it was daylight, he kept his eyes shut tight. It was a dream, he told himself firmly. I dreamed a giant called Hagrid came to tell me I was going to the school for wizard. When I open my eyes, I'll be at home in my cupboard. There was a sudden loud tapping noise. And there's Aunt Petunia knocking on the door, Harry thought, his heart thinking, his heart sinking. But he still didn't open his eyes. It had been such a good dream. Tap, tap, tap. All right, Harry Mumble, I'm getting up. He sat up and Hagrid's heavy coat fell off him. The hut was full of sunlight. The storm was over. Hagrid himself was asleep on the collapsed sofa. And there was an owl wrapping its claw on the window, a newspaper held in its beak. Harry scrambled to his feet, so happy he felt as though a large balloon was swelling inside him. He went straight to the window and jerked it open. The owl swooped in and dropped a newspaper on top of Hagrid, who didn't wake up. The owl then fluttered onto the floor and began to attack Hagrid's coat. Don't do that. Harry tried to wave the owl out of the way, but it snapped his beak fiercely at him and carried on savaging the coat. Hagrid, said Harry loudly, there's an owl. Pay him, Hagrid grunted into the sofa. What? He wants paying for delivering the paper. Look in the pockets. Hagrid's coat seemed to be made of nothing but pockets. Bunches of keys, slug pellets, balls, a ball of string, peppermint, humbugs, key bags. Finally, Harry pulled out a handful of strange looking coins. Give him five nuts, said Hagrid sleepily. Nuts? The little bronze ones. Harry counted out five little bronze coins and the owl held it out its legs so Harry could put it in the money into a small leather pouch tied to it. Then he flew off through the open window. Hagrid yawned loudly, sat up and stretched. <sighs> Best be off, Harry. Lots to do today. Gotta get you up to a London and buy all your stuff for school. Harry was turning over the wizard coins and looking at them. He had just thought of something that made him feel though the happy balloon inside him had gotten a puncture. Um, Hagrid? Hmm, said Hagrid, who was pulling on his huge boots. I haven't got any money. And you heard Uncle Vernon last night. He won't pay for me to go and learn magic. Don't worry about that, said Hagrid, standing up and scratching his head. Do you think your parents leave you with nothing? If, but if their house was destroyed, they didn't keep their gold in their house. Boy, nah, first off for us is Gringotts, Wiz Wizards Bank. Have a sausage. They're not bad cold. And I wouldn't say no to a bit of your birthday cake either. Wizards have banks? Just one. Gringotts. Run by goblins. Harry dropped the bit of sausage he was holding. Goblins? Yeah, so you'd be mad to try and rob it. I'll tell you that. Never mess with goblins, Harry. Gringotts is the safest place in the world for anything. You want to keep set, keep safe, except maybe Hogwarts. As a matter of fact, I got to visit Gringotts anyway, for Dumbledore. Hogwarts business, you know. Hagrid drew himself up proudly. He usually gets me to do important stuff for him. Fetching you, getting things from Gringotts. You know, he can trust me, see? Got everything? Come on, then. Harry followed Hagrid out onto the rock. The sky was quite clear now, and the sea gleamed in the sunlight. The boat Uncle Vernon had hired was still there, with a lot of water in the bottom after the storm. How'd you get here? Harry asked, looking around for another boat. Flew, said Hagrid. Flew? Yeah, but mm, we'll go back in this. Not supposed to use magic now that I gotcha. They settled down in the boat, Harry still staring at Hagrid, trying to imagine him flying. Seems a shame to row, though, said Hagrid, giving Harry another of his sideways looks. If I was to uh, uh, speed things up a bit, uh, you wouldn't mind not mentioning it at Hogwarts. Of course not, said Harry, eager to see more magic. Hagrid pulled out the pink umbrella again, tapped it twice on the side of the boat, and they sped off towards land. Why would you be mad to try and rob Gringotts? Harry asked. Spells, enchantments, said Hagrid, unfolding his newspaper as he spoke. 
They say there's a dragon guard in the high security vaults. And then you gotta find your way. Gringotts is hundreds of miles under London, see? Deep, deep under the underground. You'd die of hunger trying to get out, even if you did manage to get your hands on something. Harry sat and thought about this while Hagrid read his newspaper, The Daily Prophet. Harry had learned from Uncle Vernon that people liked to be left alone while they did this, but it was very difficult. He'd never had so many questions in his life. Ministerial magic messing things up as usual, Hagrid muttered, turning a page. There's a ministry of magic, Harry asked, before he could stop himself. Of course, said Hagrid. They want a Dumbledore, Dumbledore for minister, of course, but thieves never leave Hogwarts. Hogwarts. So old Cornelius Fudge got the job. Bungler, if there ever was one. So he pelts Dumbledore with owls every morning asking for advice. But what does the Ministry of Magic do? Well, their main job is to keep it from the muggles that there's still witches and wizards up and down the country. Why? Why? Why me, Harry? Everyone be wanting magic solutions to their problems. Nah, we're best left alone. At this moment, the boat bumped gently into the harbor wall. Hagrid folded up his newspaper and they clambered up the stone steps onto the street. Passerbys stared a lot at Hagrid as they walked through the little town to the station. Harry could not blame them. Not only was Hagrid twice as tall as anyone else, he kept pointing at perfectly ordinary things like parking meters and saying loudly, See that, Harry? <sighs> things these muggles dream up, eh? Hagrid, said Harry, panting a bit as he ran to keep up. Did you say there are dragons at Gringotts? Well, so they say, said Hagrid. Crikey, I'd like a dragon. You'd like one? Wanted one ever since I was a kid. Here we go. They had reached the station. There was a train to London in five minutes time. Hagrid, who didn't understand muggle money, asked, as he called it, gave the bills to Harry so he could buy the tickets. People stared more than ever on the train. Hagrid took up two seats and sat knitting what looked like a canary yellow circus tent. Still got your letter, Harry? He asked as he counted stitches. Harry took the parchment envelope out of his pocket. Good, said Hagrid. There's a list of everything you need. Harry unfolded a second piece of paper he hadn't noticed the night before and read, Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. Uniform. First year students will require <coughs> three sets of plain work robe, black. One plain pointed hat, black, for day wear. One pair of protective gloves, dragon hide or similar. One winter cloak, black, silver, with silver fastenings. Please note that all pupils' clothes should carry bean tags. Horse book. All students should have a copy of each of the following. The Standard Book of Spells, Grade 1, by Miranda Goshawk. A History of Magic, by Bathilda Bagshaw. Magical Theory, by Aldel Alda Elbert <laughs> Adalbert Waffling. A Beginner's Guide to Transfiguration, by Emeric Switch. 1,000 Magical Herbs and Fungi, by Hilda Spore. Magical Droughts and Potions by Arceus Jigger. Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them by Newt Scalmander. The Dark Forces, A Guide to Self-Protection by Quentin Trimbley. One Wand, oh, Other Equipment. One Wand, One Cauldron, Pewter, Standard Size 2. One Set of Glass or Crystal Vials. One Telescope, One Set of Brass Scales. Students may also bring an owl or a cat or a toad. Parents are reminded that first years are not allowed to bring their own broomsticks. That's all I'm getting. <clears throat> Can we buy all this in London? Harry wondered aloud. Yeah, if you know where to go, said Hagrid. Harry had never been to London before. Although Hagrid seemed to know where he was going, he was obviously not used to getting there by an ordinary way. He got stuck in the ticket barrier on the underground and complained loudly that the seats were too small and the trains were too slow. I don't know how muggles manage without magic, he said as they climbed a broken down escalator that led up to a bustling road lined with shops. 
Hagrid was so huge that he pouted, parted the crowd easily. All Harry had to do was keep close behind him. They passed bookshops and music stores, hamburger restaurants and cinemas, but nowhere that looked as if they could sell you a magic wand. This was just an ordinary street full of ordinary people. Could there really be piles of wizard gold buried miles beneath them? Were there really shops that sold spell books and broomsticks? Hmm. Might this all not be some huge joke that the Dursleys had cooked up? If Harry hadn't known the Dursleys had no sense of humor, he might have thought so. Yet somehow, even though everything Hagrid had told him so far was unbelievable, Harry couldn't help trusting him. This is it, said Hagrid, coming to a halt. The Leaky Cauldron. It's a famous place. It was a tiny, grubby-looking pub. If Hagrid, Hagrid hadn't pointed it out, Harry wouldn't have noticed it was there either. The people hurrying by didn't glance at it. Their eyes slid from the big bookshop on one side to the record shop on the other, as if they couldn't see the leaky cauldron at all. In fact, Harry had the most part particular feeling that he, that only he and Hagrid could see it. Before he could mention this, Hagrid had steered them inside. For a famous place, it was very dark and shabby. A few old woman, women were sitting in the corner drinking tiny glasses of sherry. One of them was smoking a long pipe. A little man in a top hat was talking to the old bartender, who was quite bald and looking like a toothless walnut. The low buzz of chatter stopped when they walked in. Everyone seemed to know Hagrid. They waved and smiled at him. And the bartender re reached for a glass, saying, The usual, Hagrid? Can't, Tom. I'm on Hogwarts business, said Hagrid, clapping his great hand on Harry's shoulder and making Harry's knees buckle. Good lord, said the bartender, peering at Harry. Is this, can this be? The leaky cauldron had suddenly gone completely still and silent. Bless my soul, whispered the old bartender. Harry Potter, what an honor. He hurried out from behind the bar rushed towards Harry and seized his hand, tears in his eyes. Welcome back, Mr. Potter, welcome back. Harry didn't know what to say. Everyone was looking at him. The old woman with the pipe was puffing on it without realizing it had gone out. Hagrid was beaming. Then there was a great scraping of chairs and the next moment Harry found himself shaking hands with everyone in the leaky cauldron. Doris Crockford, Mr. Potter, I can't believe I'm meeting you at last. So proud, Mr. Potter. I'm, I'm so proud. Always wanted to shake your hand. I'm all a flutter. Delighted, Mr. Potter. Just can't tell you, tell you. Dingle's the name. Douglas Dingle. I've seen you before, said Harry as D Douglas Diggle's top hat fell off in his excitement. You bowed to me once in a shop. He remembers, cried Douglas Diggle, looking around at everyone. Did you hear that? He remembers me. Harry shook hands again and again. Doris Crockfelt kept on coming back for more. A pale young man made his way forward very nervously. One of his eyes was twitching. Professor Quirrell, said Hagrid. Harry, Professor Quirrell will be one of your teachers at Hogwarts. P -p Potter, stammered Professor Quirrell, grasping Harry's hand. Can't tell you how pleased I am to meet you. So what a magic do you teach, Professor Quirrell? D -d Defense against the d -d dark arts, muttered Professor Quirrell, as though he'd rather not think about it. N not that you n n need it, eh, P Potter? He laughed nervously. You'll be g -g getting all your equipment, I suppose. I've g got to pick up a new b -b book of vampires m m myself. He looked terrified at the very thought. But the others wouldn't let Professor Quirrell keep Harry to himself. It took almost ten minutes to get away from them all. At last, Hagrid managed to make himself heard over the bobble. The babble. Must get on. Lots to buy. Come on, Harry. Doris Crockfield shook Harry's hand one last time, and Hagrid led them through the bar and out into a small walled courtyard, where there was nothing but tra a trash can and a few weeds. Hagrid grinned at Harry. Told you, didn't I? Told you you was famous. Even Professor Quirrell was trembling to meet you. Uh, mind you, he's usually trembling. He always that nervous? 
Oh, yeah. Poor bloke. Brilliant mind. He was fine while he was studying out of books, but then he took a year off to get some first-hand experience. They say he met vampires in the Black Forest, and there was a, a nasty bit of trouble with a hag. Never been the same since. Scared of students, scared of his own subject. Now, where's my umbrella? Vampires? Hags? Harry's head was swimming. Hagrid, meanwhile, was counting bricks in the wall above the trash can. Three up, two across, he muttered. Great, see him back, Harry. He tapped the wall three times with the point of his umbrella. The brick he had been touching, the brick he had touched, quivered. It wriggled. In the middle, a small hole appeared. It grew wider and wider. A second later, they were facing an archway, large enough even for Hagrid, an archway onto a cobbled street that twisted and turned out of sight. Welcome, said Hagrid, to Diagon Alley. He grinned at Harry's amazement. They stepped through the archway. Harry looked quickly over his shoulder and saw the archway shrink instantly back into a solid wall. The sun shone brightly on the stack of cauldrons outside the nearest shop. Cauldrons all sizes, copper, brass, pewter, silver, self-stirring, collapsible, said a sign, hanging over them. Yeah, you'll be needing one, said Hagrid, but we gotta get your money first. Harry wished he had about eight more eyes. He turned his head in every direction as they walked up the street, trying to look at everything at once. The shops, the things outside them, the people doing their shopping. A plump woman outside the apothecary was shaking her head as they passed, saying, Drag and liver. Sixteen sickles an ounce. They're mad. A low, soft hooting came from a dark shop with a sound saying, Elop's Owl Emporium. Tawny, Screech, Barn, Brown, and Snowy. Several boys of about Harry's age had their noses pressed against a window with broomsticks in it. Look, Harry heard one of them say, the new Nimbus 2000, fastest ever. There were shops selling robes, shops selling telescopes, and strange silver instruments Harry had never seen before. Windows stacked with barrels of bat spleens and eels eyes, pottering piles of spell books, quills, and rolls of parchment, potion bottles, globes of the moon. Gringotts, said Hagrid. They had reached a snowy white building that towered over the other little shops. Standing beside its burnished brown stores, wearing a uniform of scholar, scarlet and gold, was... Yeah, that's a goblin, said Hagrid quietly as they walked up the white stone steps towards him. The goblin was about a head shor shorter than Harry. He had a swarthy, clever face, a pointed beard, and Harry noticed very long fingers and feet. He bowed as they walked inside. Now they were facing a second pair of doors, silver this time, with words engraved upon them. Enter stranger but take heed of what awaits the sin of greed. For those who take but do not earn must pay most dearly in their turn. So if you seek beneath our floors a treasure that was never yours, thief, you have been warned, beware of finding more than treasure there. Like I said, you'd be mad and try and rob it, said Hagrid. A pair of goblins bowed them through the silver doors and they were in a vast marble hall. About a hundred more goblins were sitting on high stools behind a long counter, scribbling in large ledgers, weighing coins in brass scales, examining precious stones through eyeglasses. There were too many doors to count leading off the hall and yet more goblins were showing people in and out of these. Hagrid and Harry made for the counter. Warning, said Hagrid to the free goblin. We've come out to take some money out of Mr. Harry Potter's safe. You have his key, sir? Got it here somewhere, said Hagrid. And he started emptying his pockets onto the counter, scattering a handful of moldy dog biscuits over the goblin's book of numbers. The goblin wrinkled his nose. Harry watched the goblin on the right weigh a pile of rubies as big as glowing coals. Got it, said Hagrid at last, holding up a tiny gold key. The goblin looked at it closely. That seems to be in order. And I've also got a letter here from Professor Dumbledore, said Hagrid importantly, throwing out his chest. It's about the you know what in Vault 713. The goblin read the letter carefully. Harry 
very well, he said, handing it back to Hagrid. I will have someone take you down to both folds. Grip hook. Grip, grip, grip hook was yet another goblin. Once Hagrid had crammed all the dog biscuits back inside his pockets, he and Harry followed Grip Hook towards one of the doors leading off the halls. What's the you know what in Vault 713? Harry asked. Can't tell you that, said Hagrid mysteriously. Very secret. Hogwarts business. Dumbledore's trusted me. More than my job's worth to tell you that. Grip Hook held the door open for them. Harry, who had expected more marvel, was surprised. They were in a narrow stone passage lit with flaming torches. It sloped steeply downward and there were little railway tracks on the floor. Griffhook whistled and a small cart came hurtling up the tracks towards them. They climbed in, haggard with some difficulty, and they were off. At first they just hurtled through a maze of twisting passages. Harry tried to remember, left, right, right, left, middle fork, right, left, but it was impossible. The rattling cart seemed to know its own way because Griffhook wasn't steering. Harry's eyes stung as the cold air rushed past them, but he kept them wide open. Once he thought he saw a burst of fire at the end of the passage and twisted around to see if it was a dragon. It was too late. They plunged even deeper, passing an underground lake where huge stalactites and stalagmites grew from the ceiling and floor. I never know, Harry called to Hagrid over the noise of the cart. What's the difference between a stalagmite and a stalactite? A stalagmite's got an M in it, said Hagrid, and I don't ask me questions right now. I think I'm going to be sick. He did look very green. And when the cart stopped at last besides a small door in the passage wall, Hagrid got out and had to lean against the wall to stop his knees from trembling. Griffhook unlocked the door. A lot of green smoke came billowing out, and as it cleared, Harry grasped. Gasped. Inside were mounds of gold coins, columns of silver, heaps of little brown nuts. All yours, smiled Hagrid. All Harry's. It was incredible. The Dursleys couldn't have known about this or they would have had it from him faster than blinking. How often had they complained how much Harry had cost them to keep? And all the time he, there had been a small fortune belonging to him buried deep under London. <clears throat> Hagrid helped Harry pile some of it into a bag. The gold ones are galleons, he explained. Seventeen silver sickles to a galleon and twenty-nine nuts to a sickle. It's easy enough, right? <clears throat> that should be enough for a couple of terms. We'll keep the rest safe for you. He turned to Griffhook. Well, 713 now, please. And can we go a little bit more slowly? One speed only, said Griffhook. They were going even deeper now and gathering speed. The air became colder and colder as they hurtled round tight corners. They went rattling over an underground ravine, <clears throat> and Harry leaned over the side to try and see what was down at the dark bottom. <clears throat> but Hagrid groaned and pulled him back by the scruff of his neck. Vault 713 had no keyhole. Stand back, said Griffhook importantly. He stroked the door gently with one of his long fingers, and it simply melted away. If anyone but a Gringotts goblin tried that, they'd be stuck, sucked through the door and trapped in there, said Griffhook. How often do you check to see if anyone's inside? Harry asked. Mm, about once every 10 years, said Griffhook, with a rather nasty grin. Something really extraordinary had to be inside this top security vault, Harry was sure. And he leaned forward eagerly, expecting to see fabulous jewels at the very least. But at first, he thought it was empty. Then he noticed a grubby little package wrapped up in brown paper lying on the floor. Hagrid picked it up and tucked it deep inside his coat. Harry longed to know what it was, but knew better than to ask. Come on, back in this infernal cart and don't talk to me on the way back. It's best if I keep my mouth shut, said Hagrid. <clears throat> 